coming up tonight on KPBS Evening Edition, uncovering a culture of secrecy about child abuse. We'll talk with an author who says the culture is hurting efforts to stop the cycle of violence. And Bob Filner is opposed to pension reform, the measure on the June ballot. Now, the congressman and mayoral candidate is putting out his own proposal. KPBS Evening Edition starts now. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. I'm Dwayne Brown. The Navy is working on a deal to cut its power use this summer. If there's a danger of blackouts, the Navy is San Diego Gas and Electric's biggest customers. Under the uh, agreement, naval facilities would temporarily reduce their power if supplies get scarce. In exchange, the Navy gets a break on its electric rates. The deal is the first of its kind for the Navy. Power officials have been working on plans to conserve if the San Onofre nuclear plant stays offline. Of course, it's been shut down since late January because of equipment problems. Build on vault and coastal lights so we can live so well. But earthquake and tsunami create a living hell. Protesters rallied outside the nuclear plant yesterday demanding its permanent closure. They say problems with worn tubes in the reactor steam generators should be a wake-up call. So the message needs to be... Do not restart San Onofre this summer. That's right. Do not restart it ever. Yeah. The city of Irvine is asking the Public Utilities Commission to deny renewing the plant's license when it expires in 2022. Investigators are still trying to determine why a racing yacht broke into pieces near the Coronado Island over the uh, weekend, killing at least three people. A uh, fourth victim, the yacht skipper, still hasn't been found. Coast Guard suspended its search Sunday, a day after wreckage of the Aegean was found near the Mexican border. The yacht was taking part in a race between Newport Beach and Ensenada. The Coast Guard says it appears the yacht was hit by a large boat in the middle of the night, but they're also not ruling out the possibility it hit some rocks. Congressman Bob Filner is the only San Diego mayoral candidate who opposes the pension reform measure on the June ballot. Filner's been talking about his own plan for months, but until recently, hadn't put much on paper. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr joins us with some details. So folks have been calling on Filner, Katie, to release his plan for months. What does it consist of? Well, it basically consists of what he has been talking about. It would cap pensions at under six figures. He wants to strike a five-year labor contract with city unions. And he wants to take out bonds to help pay down some of the city's pension debt. The thinking is that the interest on the bonds would be less than the interest on the actual pension debt. And so the city would save money in the long run. He says the county's done this several times with its pension. However, critics say this doesn't offer any real reform for the pension system and just pushes the problem down the road. And how would it work with Proposition B on the June ballot? Right. Well, it really wouldn't work. Proposition B would freeze the salaries of current employees for five years, and it would switch most new hires to a 401k type of system. Of course, that doesn't work with Filner's plan because his plan includes a pension. But he says if Prop B passes and he is elected, he believes he can still implement his plan because he thinks Prop B will be tied up in court for years. KPBS Metro reporter Katie Orr. San Diego's Commission on Arts and Culture will ask for more money next year. The commission provides support for 68 arts organizations and has seen budget cuts in recent years. It's asking for a 5% increase to just over $7.5 million next year. The commissioners say the arts attracted more than $170 million in spending last year. A former Semper Energy executive who accused the company of paying bribes in Mexico is suing the Securities and Exchange Commission. Rodolfo Michelin says the SEC let Sempra pick a law firm friendly to the company to investigate the bribery charges. The investigation found no wrongdoing, and Sempra says Michelin is a disgruntled former employee. One of San Diego's biggest biotech companies is being bought out for $3.7 billion. The buyer is a Massachusetts company called Hologic. It makes medical devices. San Diego's GenPro produces diagnostic equipment, such as screening tests for HIV and the West Nile virus. It has 1,400 employees. Hologic says it will maintain a significant presence in San Diego. 
And the new study shows states are continuing to limit public scrutiny of records, uh, child abuse records, and deaths. Amitha Sharma is talking about that over at the Evening Edition Roundtable. At least 1,700 children die each year in the United States because of abuse or neglect. Child advocates say some of those deaths could be prevented if there were a better public accounting of the abuse leading to the deaths. Christina Real, senior staff attorney with the Children's Advocacy Institute at USD's Law School, is here to talk about what she believes is the need for more public scrutiny. Christina, the Children's Advocacy Institute has released a report basically saying that there's a culture of secrecy at the state level across this country that is hurting efforts to stop children from from dying because of abuse or neglect. Describe this culture. Well, basically in child welfare in general, there is a need for secrecy to, in order to protect the children, and that is where the culture starts. But when it comes to fatalities or near fatalities that come from child abuse, that need for secrecy diminishes. And in the case of a fatality, of course, the need to protect the child's privacy is diminished. And so, this, unfortunately, the states oftentimes are, don't, haven't paid attention to the federal requirement that the secrecy be diminished at the time that there is a fatality or a near fatality. Now, when we talk about secrecy, we're talking about secrecy surrounding details leading up to the child's death. What sorts of details if they saw the light of day, would, would help the next case of child abuse um, in terms of preventing another child from dying? One of the primary details that would really help is knowing whether or not this child had previous encounters with the child welfare system, and if so, what happened because of those encounters? Was, uh, did a social worker go out and decide not to remove? Or were there services that were provided to the family, but they were never actually helpful for this family? Uh, other details are what kind of abuse leads to the ch child's death. These are all different issues that would help us look at the child welfare system and see where are our fatal flaws, where can we improve. Okay, so how does this play out at the county level? And, and I know that you've graded states. What kind of grade did California receive? California received a C plus in this in this report. Previously we did do a report in 2008 and they received an A minus. And California's uh, statutes has not changed, they haven't changed at all. But what has happened is the Department of Social Services has released regulations to implement those statutes. And through those regulations, they've actually decreased the opportunities for the release of information. For example, they require that there be a relationship between, that the child be living in the home of the abuser. Well, what happens when it's mom's boyfriend, for example, that is the abuser? And maybe the boyfriend is someone who provides regular childcare for the child or is visiting often. In those cases right now under the regulations, disclosure isn't required, but our state statute doesn't actually make those kind of limitations. And so how does this play out at the county level here in San Diego? So the way the child welfare system works in general and also with respect to releasing information is the county follows what the state requires. And so when the state isn't requiring the release of information, the county isn't releasing that information, but even more so, they're not really paying attention to that information. I was a couple years ago at a meeting where we were discussing child abuse fatalities and one county representative spoke up and said, you know, it wasn't until we were required to report this information to the state that we even really paid attention to the children that were dying. Instead, we used to walk away from this information, but now we're at least having to confront this happened and let's look at what happened. So at a county level, if we're not looking at what happened, we don't know how to fix it. And so the chance of more children dying in San Diego is great. Whereas if we had the light of day, if we were looking at these cases and really paying attention to how to fix it, it would make children in San Diego County safer. Are there any efforts to get further legislation in there that would prevent regulations that would again deny the public access to this information? Well, the, like I said, the state statute that we is the same and it's what we graded and it's pretty good. But is so, there any way to get rid of the regulations that the state has implemented that basically negate the statute? And right now the Children's Advocacy Institute has filed a lawsuit to challenge these regulations in stating our position is that they don't comply with state law. So we're still in the early stages of that litigation, uh, but our goal is to enforce what state statute actually is. There is a bill right now 
in uh, in the legislature in California that would uh, provide more more information about these deaths. Christina Real, thank you for speaking to us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Sport fishing season is about to get underway in San Diego, but there are new rules to protect the fish population. The folks who run San Diego sport fishing boats are worried about hurting business. We'll have a look at the issue in just a moment. Also coming up, how skateboarding is influencing surfing and what it means for keeping Native American culture alive and well. This is KPBS Evening Edition. Tonight on KPBS, at 8 on Antiques Roadshow from Atlanta, Georgia, examine extremely rare photographs of Sherman's 1864 March to the Sea and the Burning of Atlanta. Then at 9, the Roadshow moves to Providence, Rhode Island, once the costume jewelry capital of the world, for a look at vintage, fabulous fake jewelry. And at 10 on America Revealed, the nation's power grid, its vulnerabilities, and ingenuity required to keep the electricity on. That's tonight on KPBS. The American people have named PBS the most trusted source of news and public affairs for the eighth year in a row. Trust. The American people have spoken. Thank you. I'm Jeffrey Brown. On the next news hour, the latest news, analysis, and in depth reporting you've come to expect from our team. That's Monday on the PBS News Hour. KPBS Evening Edition is made possible by Joan and Erwin Jacobs and by This year's San Diego sport fishing season will be different from any before. That's because huge swaths of ocean are off limits to anglers. KPBS business and environment reporter Eric Anderson says the region's first marine protected areas were established in January, and it's creating uncertainty among those who make a living from the sea. Uh, you might check and see if we need a little more anywhere because I'm done here. We've got a dab left in the tray. Captain Buzz Brizendine is getting his overnight fishing boat ready for the season. If everything works out well, the railings will be packed this summer. We'll have people around the, scattered around the rail here that we're just now finishing up. And this big box-shaped thing behind me here is the bait tank. And we would have between 50 and 100 scoops of live sardines primarily in the bait tank. The Prowler is one of about 45 sport fishing boats working out of San Diego Bay. Yellowtail, barracuda, and bass are how anglers know that spring has arrived. But the fleet's books are usually balanced in the summer when the tuna are biting. It's the bread and butter of this industry, and so the tuna season is absolute chaos here, but everyone's happy and, and either coming in or going out. But fishing is not easy. The California Sport Fishing Association's Bob Fletcher says the ocean can be fickle. A temperature swing of a couple of degrees can push key sport fish out of range for local boats. The recession also hurts. Customers are scarce, and fuel is expensive. And there's been four or five boats that have already uh, basically gone bankrupt here in San Diego. And they're, if we have another bad year, it's going to be, uh, there'll be more. And uh, the MLPA has not helped. MLPA is the Marine Life Protection Act. The measure puts large swaths of ocean off limits to anglers. One of those areas is just off the coast of La Jolla. So there's the rocky intertidal, and around that point uh, is rocky habitat and a huge uh, kelp forest. And then as you come around here where the surfers are, this is a sandy beach that would have uh, intertidal clams and things like that. Russ Vetter works for the Southwest Marine Fisheries Service. His, his agency is charged with managing the nation's fishing stocks. Mistakes that were made in the 50s and 60s and 70s, I think, are being uh, corrected. Vetter says the marine protected areas are part of a sweeping effort to keep stocks healthy. He says creating the marine reserves took more than a decade, but something had to be done. And even the sport fishing community will tell you 
that while they may be selling trips to conventioneers and they may be catching some of the more abundant fish, it certainly wasn't like it was back in the 1950s and 60s. And while fish management is a lot better, it's hardly perfect. Better says regulators struggle to make the right decisions, but sometimes that's all washed away by the California current. If we have these wild swings in temperature and El Nino and La Nina, so even when everything's done right, you can have a decrease in the population and, and then a few years later, a sudden increase. The conservationists and researchers hope the marine protected areas create breeding grounds that will feed fishing stocks outside the reserves. Scripps Institution of Oceanography scientist Ed Parnell wants the kelp forest off the shore of La Jolla to look more like the big kelp tank in the Birch Aquarium. There's lots of fish here, um, and a lot of them are really large compared to what we see out in the wild. And I'm hoping that within you know, the next five years that we'll start seeing some of these, these are kelp bass here, um, and sheephead that will be seeing more of them, and we'll be seeing them in larger sizes. Parnell says creating an environment where fish can get old and big helps those fish propagate. But marine reserves are different than their above ground counterparts. There's not a lot of support in terms of looking at how effective they are or enforcing them or even maintaining the, their, their, you know, the markers for their edges and things like that. Parnell worries there may still be fishing inside the reserve areas because it's tough to see the boundaries. He says the marine protected areas are still a work in progress and the impact is uncertain. The impact that Captain Buzz Brizendine wants to see is on his bottom line, MLPA or not. He's hoping to land a thousand paying customers this season enough to call 2012 a good year. The California sport fishing industry challenged the creation of the reserves in court. They lost, but are appealing the ruling. The recent defection of San Diego mayoral candidate Nathan Fletcher from the Republican Party may have spawned a new approach to the politics of governing. Amitha is taking a closer look at the roundtable. More than two dozen business executives in San Diego publicly switched parties this month in what is being called the movement to the middle. Scott Dickey, CEO of Competitor Group and Ron King, political science professor at San Diego State University, join me to talk about the phenomena. Scott, let's start with you. You switched your party affiliation last week to independent. What was it before and why did you make the change? I've been a lifelong Republican. Um, I made the decision uh, following uh, Nathan Fletcher's announcement and really being inspired by his bold move. Um, I started talking about it socially am among a number of my friends and, and colleagues and we all felt very similarly about our dissatisfaction with the current political system and the divisive nature of the, of the dogma and the rhetoric that comes out of both sides, uh, Democratic and Republican, and I felt it was time really for me personally to make a statement and leave my party affiliation in favor of a direction that's going to be focused on progress and solutions. So had you thought about making a switch before Nathan Fletcher did? And, and if not, what was it that, that he did that inspired you so much? Well, I've, I've had the great pleasure of knowing Nathan for over a decade. And he and I have talked uh, at ad nauseum, you know, uh, many, many dinner conversations about the dysfunctional nature of a two-party system and how over the past decade, the parties have moved further and further to the fringe. And the classic example is yesterday, uh, Carl DeMaio's campaign manager, Ryan Klumper, Klumpner, uh, wrote uh, in response to a UT editorial on the issue, he wrote, quote, unquote, Nathan Fletcher is nothing more than a slimy politician masquerading as the second coming of Christ. This is the reason why you have to leave the political system where it exists today, and you've got to come to the middle. This type of rhetoric, it, it, there's no place for it in politics. In my world in business, you'd be shown the door, you'd be fired after an email like that. It's time we move away from this partisan rhetoric and get to the middle. So, Professor, I want to switch over to you. You have Nathan Fletcher, who was seen as somewhat of a golden child for the California Republican Party, and now you've got two dozen business executives who are leaving the party here in San Diego. Four what dozen. does this say about the condition of the state's Republican Party? I think it says something more about the nature of political strategy. For more than 50 years, political scientists have said that the politician who moves to the middle who stands for the median voter has a much greater chance of winning an election than a politician who doesn't stand for the median voter. Uh, whether 
I, I can't speak to Nathan Fletcher's personal motives, but it is a logical and strategic political move. Has it inspired any soul searching within the Republican Party? Again, I can't speak to individual psychology, but large numbers of individuals who register as independents, by the time we sit and do a survey and ask who have you voted for in the past and what are your views on certain issues and what is your socioeconomic group, with 95% probability, we can sort them into Democrats and Republicans. Do you expect voters to follow suit? We, we, we announced last Wednesday, so we're, we're less than a week into this, and the response has been overwhelming. Not only have we, have we gone from 35 CEOs and community leaders to well over 50, pushing 60 now, but hundreds and hundreds now pushing over 1,000 uh, uh, voters have signed onto the website, read the declaration, and have asked for more information. So we know we've struck a chord. Um, the, the, the alienated majority is going to awaken in this election and we're going to bring more people to the polls on this primary and we're going to see the results uh, on you know on June 6th. There's a new book out and it's called It's Even Worse Than What You Think It Is I, I believe that's the title <laughs> um, and in it Thomas Mann of the Brookings Institution and uh, Norm Ornstein of the American Enterprise Institute write that Congress is so dysfunctional now, and they blame the problem on the Republican Party. They call it the insurgent outlier. What do you think of that characterization? The data is strong, and the characterization you've just given is almost right. Both parties have moved away from the median, again, over the last 20 or so years, largely a function of districts that are non-competitive and the fact that the vast majority of people active in politics who give money or inv get involved in campaigns are to the extremes and not the middle. Statistically, the Republican Party has moved considerably away from the middle, more than the Democratic Party has. Um, and so to that extent, the Ornstein man data are correct. Okay, gentlemen, we'll have to wrap it there. Thank you for speaking to us today. Thank you so much. The San Diego Museum of Man is ramping it up. In a moment, we'll give you a look at its newest exhibition. You might want to call the kids in to check it out, too. This is KPBS Evening Edition. fastest human the quintessential olympic hero but his triumph was in more than just a race the olympics were to be a symbol of german racial superiority hitler was absolutely livid after winning all those gold medals he expected the whole nation to love him and here the greatest athlete in america is being treated shabbily jesse owens on american experience tuesday at eight on kpbs Hi, I'm Yul Kwan from the new PBS series, America Revealed. Make Wednesdays your destination for exploration. First, see what it takes to survive the first days of life in the wild on nature. Next, on Nova, can a computer beat the best contestants on Jeopardy? Then, join me for America Revealed and see how we are all part of a new industrial revolution. This Wednesday, PBS is your destination for exploration. About 12 million kids actively skateboard in the U.S. That's more than the number enrolled in Little League Baseball. Skateboard culture is also influencing life on Indian reservations. San Diego's Museum of Man shows us how it all started with surfing. From surfboards and the Beach Boys rock and roll to skateboards and hip-hop music, Ramp It Up traces the history of skateboarding from its origins in native Hawaiian culture to the surf culture in Southern California. It's just a really fun, different kind of thing to have here in a museum setting where typically you got to be quiet, uh, you can't touch anything, and you know we're trying to send a, a new message. It's a different kind of museum in our community. It all started when Duke Kahana Moku introduced surfing to America in the early 20th century, keeping his native tradition alive. Hawaiians also surfed on land in the late 1930s using a long, narrow sled made with two wooden runners held together. Thirty years later, surfing took off in California, and by the 1970s, so did its land cousin, skateboarding. The message of skateboarding really is, you're going to fall down, you know, you're going to get knocked off your horse, and you got to get back on. you got to 
uh, adapt and you got to move forward and you got to develop your skills. And just like Native Hawaiians use surfing to keep their culture alive, Native American kids are learning more about their culture by participating in skateboard powwows. Todd Harder, seen in these photos, creates and sells skateboards and uses that to engage the kids. He says to a kid who says, I want to buy a skateboard, he says, well, tell me how you say your name in your native language first. And the kid says, well, I don't know. And he says, well, go ask your grandma, go ask your auntie how you say your native name in your language, and come back and tell me, and then I'll sell you the board. The approach is apparently working. The Pala Band of Indians in San Diego's North County have built a 22,000-square-foot skate park on the reservation. And back at the Museum of Man is an interactive feature for the exhibit. This is a board's eye view of the indoor mini skate ramp built on the south balcony of the museum. People can walk upstairs, do a double take, and say, wow, there is a skateboard ramp in the museum. It sends a whole other message about what a museum can be and what you can do in a museum. Now, San Diego is the first stop on the exhibit's 12-city tour. Ramp It Up runs through September 9th at the Museum of Man in Balboa Park. We had more than 60 likes on our Facebook page for our story on Friday about the first gay marriage proposal on a military base. Corey Houston proposed to Avarice Guerrero at Camp Pendleton last week on Facebook. Claire Vanette wrote, I hope it's legal for all our men and women in uniform to get married soon. On our website, Jean Mark wrote, The gay minority makes more noise for its size than any other in the country, and the media gives them more attention than any other minority in this country. I don't understand why. Why is it that such a small portion of the population is so extremely vocal and gets so much attention? And Peking Duck SD responded, Gene, if gay people had the same rights as everyone else, things like this wouldn't be newsworthy. Of course, you can weigh in on the conversation, too, by following us on Twitter, liking us on Facebook, and, of course, you can email us. Recapping some of tonight's top stories, the Navy is nearing a first-time agreement to reduce electricity in San Diego if power runs short this summer. The deal is intended to reduce the threat of blackouts while the San Onofre nuclear plant remains offline. Congressman and mayoral candidate Bob Filner has released his pension reform plan. He wants to cap city pensions at under six figures, put half of any projected budget surplus toward the pension debt, and possibly take out bonds to pay the debt down sooner. Filner is the only mayoral candidate who does not support the ballot measure in June to put most new city workers into a 401k plan. You can find tonight's stories on our website, kpbs.org slash evening edition. Thanks for joining us. You have a great night.